Hello and welcome to Talk Gnosis. We put together another panel of all returning all stars, everybody who's been on Talk Gnosis before, a panel that looks suspiciously like the panel that we did for the Gospel of John with one magical addition. Folks, we're talking about the Gospel of Mark and joining me to talk about Gnosticism, the Gospel of Mark, things we like about it in Mark, things we hate about Mark, uh, ways that Gnostics and esotericists and mystics can use Mark. Uh, we're going to ramble all about that. We're going to download our Gnosis about this canonical biblical text into your ear holes, granting you enlightenment. Before we get into that, some introductions. We've got uh, Deacon Angie joining us yet again. Hello, Deacon. Uh, we've got, of course, co-host Jason Memo. Hi, Jason. Uh, hey, everybody. Hey, Nick Lachetti's back. Hi, Nick. Hey, everybody. And uh, first time on the panel, but not, not the first time on the show. I think this is his third or fourth time. We have uh, Harvard scholar uh, Clark Atkins. <laughs> Hello, Clark. Hello. <laughs> Just beaming in from the Ivy League here, blessing us. <laughs> uh, Clark, um, I'm really happy to have you here because uh, we were sort of talking about before the show that, you know, this, this is meant to be particularly chill because we do a lot of really scholarly stuff on Talk mm -hmm. Gnosis. We interview a, a lot of, of people about some, some pretty intricate, you know, deep, detailed scholarly stuff. So, you know, we want to have some scholarly reflections, but at the same time, this is just our, our hot takes on Mark, our personal gnosis. But but I know you do uh, read and, and speak Biblical Greek, Koine Greek, is that what it's called? So I'll definitely... Yeah, Koine work. Yeah, that works. Yeah, um, but I definitely have some questions about, about the Greek of, of Mark, which we'll, which we'll get into, uh, you know, uh, kind of starting now. So I'm, I've always been fond, uh, and people who watch the show regularly know that, that I actually really like the Gospel of Mark. And I highly recommend that people read it, maybe in De uh, David Bentley Hart's translation, because it's, it's a deeply weird book. Um, and I kind of wish I could give myself brain damage um, so that I could read it for the first time and not have any presuppositions because, you know, we think we know who Jesus is. We think we know the terms like the son of man, like we know what they mean, but nothing's really spelled out in Mark. So because of the last 2000 years of Christian suppositions, we read the book partly through thing, through these lenses and we think we already know like who these characters are and what these ideas are. But if you really dig in, perhaps that's not actually accurate. So, so I really like Mark because of that. It's thought to be the first, the first gospel. It's thought to be one of the earliest Christian writings ever. It's dated anywhere from uh, the, the mid-70s uh, uh, common era up until like 99, but most people, I think, put it in the 70s. Um, so very, very ancient text. And again, it's, it's deeply weird. So talking about the Greek or one reason why, if you can't read biblical Greek, which I'm assuming you can't, uh, why you may want to read uh, David Bentley Hart's or other uh, translations of it is, is it's, it's in the Greek, which, which David does in his translation, is actually in the present tense. And it makes the book read really weird. And it also makes it read really um, uh, vibrantly and... Uh, uh, famously, Mark um, says the word immediately uh, about a thousand times. If you want to play a drinking game, uh, sit down, you know, with a bottle of wine or uh, uh, you know a, a big bottle of hard liquor, of whiskey, and take a shot every time the word immediately pops up in in the Gospel of Mark. You know, you'll be dead of alcohol poisoning about ten pages in. <laughs> but I really also love. Like it's it's almost like listening to a kid describe things because it's also famous as famous for its run-on sentences, but it's almost like one run-on sentence. It's like the narrator just took a big breath and it's like, okay, one time there's this guy named Jesus and he went and got baptized and then all of a sudden he was uh, being tempted by the, the devil and then all of a sudden John the Baptist got his head chopped off and then, then he died and he got resurrected. That's like, you, you, things happen really quickly um, and there's not uh, a lot of hand-holding and I kind of forgot when I was rereading Mark, like, you know, Jesus' baptism, uh, the um, the spirit descending upon him like a dove, then the temptation in the desert. All of this happens in like four sentences. It's all in the same paragraph in Mark. And that happens like so much. You see scenes that are sort of blown out or are larger, longer in Matthew and Luke are, are like one sentence in Mark. So yeah, um, we'll talk about the um, 
Oh, Angie just just reminded me. Thank you, Angie. Uh, we we need money. I'm going to change the topic. Um, <laughs> could you, if you're listening or watching to this, can you give us money? Uh, because we needed to do the show. Um, uh, we'll we'll take loaves and fishes too. Yeah, loaves and yeah. fishes. Yeah. 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 Um, so go to PayPal dot, or patreon.com slash Gnostic <laughs> and you can donate for as little as a dollar per piece of media per month and subscribe and to help us keep the show going in return you get early access to the shows uh, again we were talking about things that we can give you in return for supporting us but we don't want to lock up content behind a paywall because it makes us feel icky you can message me and just be like I'll sign up for your Patreon if you know if you do a little dance for me and you record the dance and send me the dance uh, or perhaps we're talking about we'll either give you um, uh uh, uh, high esoteric degrees for signing up, or maybe NFTs. We're, we're, we'll work this out. <laughs> uh, PayPal.com slash Gnostic for one-time donations. Okay. Back to Mark. What, I, what I'll finally say is, you know, I particularly love it because it's, uh, as one person said, it's the Cinderella gospel, which is, it's, it's not really beloved or used a lot in mainstream Christianity because the same stories and same narratives are in Matthew and Luke and Matthew and Luke are less weird. So people sort of, people sort of prefer to get their, their Jesus stories from those narratives, but they're both based on Mark. Uh, so it's a Cinderella gospel. Nobody likes it. It's the briefest, least literal colloquial and abbreviated. Um, okay. I'm going to stop talking and um, Jason. Oh boy. Um, <laughs> what, what are well, your hot takes on Mark? My, my hot takes on Mark. So it was it was interesting, like, um, for anybody who who's just hearing this for the first time or this bit for the first time, um, I uh, like I'm I'm passingly familiar with most of the stories in the Bible, but I've never really read through any of the books of the Bible. And so we read through I read through John for uh, the last episode or the episode we did on the book of John. And now I read uh, Mark. And uh, in that comparison, John feels like it's the, you know, it's the weird one. It's the epiphatic one that's like talking about, like trying to get you to understand things that can't be explained in words. And then this one feels like, like a Wikipedia summary of, of Jesus's life. Like kind of in that run, run on sentence or that, like, here's as much information as I can give you with as little description and framing as possible. Like just, he went here, he did this, this happened, this happened, this happened, here, this happened. Um, it also felt kind of like if I was trying to make sure that my uh, uh, tradition had like a, a bullet point form of like a bunch of, of the rules and sayings, this felt like this is maybe the kind of text I would generate. Yeah. Um, like, uh, cause it, it felt like I was hearing a lot of the, I was hearing a lot of the famous quotes, but then it was also like, it was also a lot of like, Jesus explains the joke. Like, Jesus will say something weird and then it's like, then they looked upon him and did not understand. And then Jesus explains it. <laughs> like, <laughs> you yeah. know, you understand this myth means this. Um, uh, so yeah, like it felt like it was really like, if John was about wanting you to dwell on the question, it really feels like Mark is kind of going, this is awesome, but like, I don't want you to be at all confused by the time you're done. I, uh, for the Jesus explaining stuff, you know, one of my favorite uh, parts in the book that, that I think a lot of modern readers miss is uh, Jesus makes a poop joke and the uh, uh, disciples, the apostles, <laughs> the disciples don't get it. And then he has to break it down and explain it to them. It's the, it's the what goes into you doesn't make you unclean, but what comes out of you does, right? And it's like what he meant was poop. And because they're talking about food and then yeah. they're like, we don't get that Jesus. And he breaks it down. And he's like, the stuff that comes out of you and goes into the toilet. <laughs> That's kind of like the stuff that comes out of you when you are being hateful, mean or cruel. Do you get it, guys? Um, that's another reason why, why I like Mark and, and why we can kind of get into, you know, I'm not quite there yet, but some of the Gnostic interpretations are getting to Gnostic interpretations. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's, it's originally a Gnostic text or generated by uh, Gnostic Christians the same way that, say, Secret John or uh, the Gospel of Thomas is. But 
and of course you can interpret anything any way, right? I was sort of talking about that with the uh, um, Gnostic commentaries on the Gospel of John, right? You have, uh, you know, Jesus went to Jerusalem and then the writer is like, you know, this represents the ascension to the Pleroma. So you can, uh, if you can take like very, you can say, take very simple statements and say, this means that. And of course there are layers of symbolism and there are times that, it, that an author is trying to create the, this sort of resonance. But then there's other times being like, ah, that, that's kind of a stretch. But I, but I think because Mark doesn't have this, um, like Jason, you're kind of talking about how it's not mysterious, right? Where, where John has more mystery, but but mm -hmm. I find Mark's immediacy, um, the, the kind of abrupt, kind of surly Jesus that's in Mark <laughs> is is also kind of mysterious, right? And kind of gnosticy. You know, he's giving this knowledge people aren't getting it. You have to interpret it. He will uh, take you aside and give you the gnosis, but in a private way. I think that mm -hmm. kind of pops up at least twice in Mark. It says, you know, Jesus to the crowds gave parables, but only explained them to the uh, disciples. And I almost feel like if you think about the logos, the living Jesus, the, the resurrected Jesus, you know, almost kind of a, re I, I see that in my personal spiritual life as almost kind of a reflection, right? Where the, the logos will sort of give you that inner knowledge. Anyways, uh, uh, Deacon Angie, hot, hot takes, first impressions, <laughs> what do you got on your mind about Mark? A uh, couple things. Um... You know, once I started reading the gospel, I immediately was thinking of Jesus the magician. You know, he's doing a lot of miracles in this one. So I did take a look a little bit at Morton Smith's Jesus the mm -hmm. magician. Um, you know, there's a lot in there that that is a little bit weedy, but he talks a lot about how there's a tension between the Christ of faith and then Jesus of history history, right? So we've got all these elaborate miracles, but then also we're, we're right next to the historical Jesus. And I think, you know, as you're reading the book, you're sort of whiplashed through, through that experience and, and just sort of where, where is my faith? Where, where is the history and, and just the big smorgasbord of nonsense that it kind of becomes in the New Testament. And then we're constantly fighting, is this literally what happened or is this a parable? And, and you, I really get a sense of that right from the get-go in Mark. Yeah. Uh, I, we'll come back to Morton Smith and uh, the magician Jesus, but it, it is interesting. You know, there's uh, there's scenes. You, there, I believe there's a healing scene, maybe when he's, he's healing uh, a blind man. Uh, he spits in the mud. And then he rubs the the mud and the spit into the man's eyes, and then he says he has to say something. He says basically a magic word, uh, which is um, in uh, uh, Mark, um, I, I think, in Aramaic. So then it's it's like you know Jesus says they make sure that that it's not in Greek, right? Because that sort of conveys that this is a magic word. This is a word of power because it's in another language, right? Um, so Jesus has to say, you know, he has to perform a little ritual. He has to make a little potion. He has to say a magic word. Um, and, you know, this does seem to be similar to, to what people think of as, as magic or magical healing. And when you read those same stories in... Um, Luke, uh, particularly Luke, who really doesn't like magicians, uh, Luke and Matthew, they, uh, they, they keep the healing, but Jesus just does it through Jesus' power, right? He doesn't have to do the extra steps. He doesn't have to do the ritual. He doesn't have to say the magic words. You know, they're editing Mark to take this, this uh, vision, this idea of Jesus out of the story. So it kind of shows you, I think, I think that kind of points to something there. You know, if somebody is editing it to take that out, oh, okay, you know, that's, maybe there's something that is uh, being covered up here. Uh, but we'll come back to that. Uh, Clark. Uh, yeah, my hot take on Mark. So Mark is, um, is fun because it, the Greek is so simple and it's something that you, when you start studying um, biblical Greek, it's a text that you'll get a lot of practice passages from because everything is in the present tense and there's a lot of repeated terms and it's very straightforward English or very straightforward Greek and it makes for what seems to be very straightforward English. Um, and I think when I was going through it and I did actually do Bentley Hart's translation. That's so that's my go to every time. And I had to, so I had that and, and a Greek interlinear Bible on the other hand. So um, it's, I think it's important to try to keep in mind that the guy who wrote the Gospel of Mark doesn't really have the strongest grasp of Greek, but the ideas he's trying to get through in the Greek are complicated. There's a lot of details he's not going to be able to get, get to you. And I think we kind of have to like 
look in between the lines to try to understand some of the complicated stuff. The stories seem a little more simplified, but it's not that the author's take on the stories are simple. It's that he has a language barrier. Um, I think that's kind of important to try to keep in mind. Ah, yes, uh, I don't know that. I, I don't know that. Uh, I, I don't think of uh, as, as Mark as being particularly go, uh, agnostic. Yeah. Um, there's no strong emphasis on on a personal relationship with divinity or personal experience with divinity that really popped out to me. What popped out to me was faith in Jesus, which is a little bit more authoritarian than Gnostics like their religion. But you could possibly argue that it is a little bit Gnostic insofar as there is an emphasis on magic in the text in various ways. It comes up with getting across, like we see some hints into Jesus's possible ritualization. We see magical words, like you said, but there is a, a, this notion that, um, that I kind of am starting to, to buy into a little bit that Gnosticism comes in a large part from a pre-existing magical or esoteric system. So we get a lot of the weird words that we find from, from um, uh, in our Gnostic, actual Gnostic texts from a system that sort of probably predated it. And the magical system came before Gnosticism. That's the theory right now. Don't ask me to go into any more details right now about that. I, I can't. Um, but it makes a lot of sense. And I find, that I, to me, it's interesting that that fits with what's going on a, a lot of the the, the otherworldliness that's going on with Mark, because as simple as it is, there's a lot of otherworldliness going on in Mark. I think. Yeah, I, I concur, and and I don't think it's it's a quote unquote Gnostic text, like I said yeah. before. But that said, you know, I think it does come from an early stage of Christianity. Of course, the first two, maybe even three centuries of Christianity. You know, there aren't these clear barriers and boundaries between different forms of christianity right and different uh uh different takes on jesus uh mm -hmm. so um so what becomes gnosticism or what becomes christian gnosticism because like clark was saying i actually think it might you know i think it's it, it's a previous system uh i i'm one of the i it's kind of out of the scholarly mainstream right now that that gnosticism predates christianity but i think it does um but, but that said uh you know i don't think quote unquote gnostics created it but it's coming out of a matrix of of christianity where there aren't a lot of boundaries beliefs um and um uh hard dogmas and because mark is mysterious um at least in my reading of it but but i guess other people's readings as well th there is some evidence uh which we'll get into a secret mark that if gnostics didn't write it they used it it does there, there is some some sort of secondhand oh, evidence that uh Gnostic groups in the second century were really fond of Mark. And I think part of this fondness was it's easy to do these read-ins because of the mysterious Jesus um, and because of maybe some of those deeper things that you're talking about, Clark, that, that the writer can't quite express, but you get that he's getting to something deeper. So the Gnostics are sort of filling in the blanks. Um, and how we know, and, and some of this is very... Uh, um, uh, circumstantial the evidence but uh you know there's uh there's stuff from the heresiologists and from the church fathers where they're they're not quoting and using mark a lot um and they're preferring prefer preferring matthew and luke um and there's some sort of like offhandish derogatory comments aimed at mark so and some limited evidence that some gnostic groups were using it so some some scholars have said oh, okay you know this is the evidence right that that the church fathers um and the these early writers they see Seem pretty uncomfortable with Mark. They're not quoting it. They're not using it. And that's because Gnostic groups have sort of adopted it at that time and they're using it. So they want to orientate people away from what those dirty Gnostics are reading and using towards, you know, uh, other texts. And, you know, the, and, and I think, you know, Matthew and Luke are based on on Mark. And I think that partly is to get rid of some of these ambiguities, right? Um, and to solve some of these mysteries that are in the text. Um, Nick, uh, hot takes on Mark. Um, yeah, so I, I feel like a couple of the interesting things I've marked for me is that, um, you know, it's actually been two interpretations I've heard have been really kind of significant or have come up for me a lot while reading this. One is that Mark is, because of the emphasis on exorcism and this magic that we've been talking about, that it was, it partially served as like a handbook of exorcism in the early church. Um, I've heard that theory a few times. So, you know, putting, you know, including the magic word or the formula or all that stuff that it actually was a way to teach how to actually do that because that was the, the job of the disciples to go out and imitate Jesus in doing that. Um, and then, you know, kind of in favor of that interpretation, recently I was reading more about medieval Christian kind of popular religion 
And there was a few texts, including Mark, where Jesus heals the paralytic boy uh, that was actually used specifically as a magic formula, even by the middle, later Middle Ages, where that would be an exorcism or a healing, would be to read that text or to even create like a talisman out of it. So there's magic in this text for sure. And then the other interpretation that's not, I don't think, actually contradictory to that, but it, it, at, at first it kind of feels that way, is that there's a, a, a really powerful tradition of reading Mark um, as a post-colonial and kind of anti-imperial text. So Ched Myers wrote this really classic book called Binding the Strongman, which I recommend people to check out if they haven't heard of it, um, which is kind of a Catholic worker's perspective. It's sort of about Mark as like an anti-imperial text, both against the Roman authorities and the Jerusalem temple authorities, which you can kind of see in the text. So in those kind of post-colonial readings, the demons and kind of the exorcism become, you know, kind of the psychic effects on the people of this Roman occupation. Um, so I don't think, again, they don't seem really contradictory, those interpretations that it's magic and exorcism versus kind of uh, dealing with the imperial powers. Like, I think we've talked about that on other episodes uh, in terms of like the archons being these powers. But that to me is not quite Gnostic, but is a potential way of reading it in this kind of like spiritual warfare way, um, which does kind of relate more to esoteric or Gnostic reading. So I think there's something there that's interesting. Um, but yeah, those are the two that, yeah, go ahead, John. Oh, no, sorry. I, I didn't want to interrupt you because I, I, I was just going to say, because uh, I, I want you to talk about that forever. But I, I think Clark <laughs> might also have some some similar interpretations or some similar reading. And I was just going to say, again, that divide of time, there's things that we, that we miss, right? So so famously, there's a sequence where there's, you know, the man possessed by demons who, who cannot fit into society. He's out in the wilderness, and it's a legion of demons, right? It specifically says legion. Uh, Jesus expels the legion into... Um, a, a herd of pigs that then runs over the cliff and commits suicide, right? And of course, pigs are famously unclean in uh, in Hebrew religion. So yeah, I really so we kind of miss some of the the anti colonial, anti empire readings of uh, of that simple story because the word legion is specifically a Roman um, military term. And yeah. they it uses the text uses the the uh, the Greek uh, Roman military term. So so listeners and readers at that time would have got exactly. So like I'm trying to think of um okay so say uh, India in the 1930s, which was uh, um, colonized uh, was still a colony of, of Britain. So if uh, if some Hindu was was telling a story, which is like uh, you know the holy man came and there was a traumatized man possessed by a demon, and the name of the demon was the British Army, <laughs> and then he exorcised a demon named the British Army, and it went into these unclean animals and died. Like everybody listening to that story, it's they're going to get it. It's not that subtle, right? But now it's really subtle for us because that phrase legion, everybody reading and listening to that term, like would have known it's, it's, it's equivalent to saying Roman uh, army, right? So it's like, and then, then there's this demon named Roman army that, that Jesus exercises. So yeah, Nick, I, I think, yeah. I think you're spot on with, uh, with, with, with some of these readings. And, and as I said, it's, it's kind of sad that we, we miss them now, or we need more yeah. context. I would say one other thing just quick is, is that, um, cause we didn't mention the, in terms of the date, uh, you know, Ched Myers in that book, Binding the Strongman, tries to date it to like 69 AD. And part of that is nice. because that's right before, yeah, <laughs> that, that part of that is right before it's the destruction of the temple. So, yeah. and because I mean, whether it's 70 AD or around there, it's, it's related to the Jewish war with Rome. So it's in that context in some way. Uh, I think that's also an important piece of that. It's, it's interesting that you guys are talking about the casting out of demons, because when you go into the Greek a little bit with demons, I don't know that I, I'm not going to say that the author meant it this way, but the notion, and, and this fits in with the Gnostic interpretation, a possible later Gnostic interpretation, the concept of demons are fate. So yeah. it's something that's forced on you. And when and a, a person, a, a daimona is a mona, a daimoni is a monos. I'm not saying that right. I, I usually just do Greek in my head. Um, is one who's a demoniac, which is a great word in English, or one who's possessed by a demon, but also can be seen with not too much hard work as one who was fate appointed, who was appointed by fate, who's being controlled oh, by fate. No and way. This, clearly, yeah, so this ties in very much with the notion that the empire is controlling things. Yeah. 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 It yeah. I think I think those things are very tight. And now, of course, you have to understand that now I'm talking about demons, and so this would separate the casting out of demons from the healing, which some people might not like want to want to do. So I'm making a distinction between unclean spirits, which are mentioned a few times, and demons. 
um, in that process. I had no idea. Well, that definitely leads to a, a deeper Gnostic reading because, you, know, mm -hmm. you know, of course, the Gnostics were obsessed with fate and they believed that, you know, fate was what uh, the Archons and the Demiurge used to control us and that Gnostics were, were free from fate. So right. if if you right. can translate Demoniac as the one, the, what is it, the one controlled by fate, the one Eight under appointed. fate? Yeah. Eight appointed is what, yeah. Yeah. So it, it's like, yeah, like the, how could a Gnostic not read that and be like, Guys, come on. Uh, and going back to the empire, you know, the, Jesus talks a lot about famously the kingdom of heaven, right? But you can translate it as God's empire. Uh, the same word used for Roman empire that, that's translated uh, is, is the same word used for kingdom uh, in Mark, right? So again, we're kind of missing this because if you use God's empire, the, uh, the literary construction becomes much more obvious, right? The, the author of Mark, I just call Mark for convenience's sake, same thing with Mark, uh, Mark, Matthew, Luke, John, we don't actually know who wrote it, uh, but um, uh, it, it becomes the, the literary construction uh, and the ironic contrast become much more evident, right? Which is, hey, there's God's kingdom, and then there's Rome's kingdom. Which one are you going to belong to? Which one are you going to choose? Which one do you want to uh, uh, last eternally on earth, right? All this becomes much more uh, evident, I, I believe. Um, I, okay. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say I, that that story about um, that's pretty famous about the you know when the the Pharisees try to get Jesus on paying taxes and then he <laughs> has the coin he says give to Caesar was Caesar give to God was God's I I, I don't know if people have, if, how common this is uh, but I feel like Tertullian said it first maybe but it was this idea that Jesus saying that um, everyone would know that you know all of creation is made in the image of God so everything is God so it's kind of a, an insult. Some people have read it as like, I know some conservative evangelicals have read it as in you should pay your taxes and respect the government and all that kind of stuff. But in the, in the way of interpreting it, where you think of, you know, Jesus's Jewish kind of community, understanding creation is made in the image of God, then what is stamped with God? It's everything stamped with Caesar is these, these coins. So um, another kind of gets, gets to speak to that idea of God's empire versus the Roman empire and, you know, contrasting them in some of the texts. And, and to stay on that theme for a moment, uh, you know, just, uh, famously as well, the emperor was known as the son of God, right? Mm -hmm. That was one of his, his main titles. Uh, and he was understood as the adopted son of a god, uh, well, <laughs> you know, like, one who had was, been divinized. Were, were, the, uh, uh, were the emperors already being deified at this point? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So, like, there was very much like a, <laughs> a very literal son of God, but a, but a less uh, um, totalizing, I think, like, conception. Like, I... The, the impression I get is that people aren't thinking of the emperor or even the past emperors who have been deified as gods in the same intensity, if that makes sense. Like, <laughs> I don't know. I, I'd, I'd be interested to know how how authentic that that deification was taken. But um, uh, but just to kind of even also stay on the whole empire thing is that the, so the the. Um, one of the things I said at the beginning was that it felt like to me, like this text is very much trying to establish the bona fides of Jesus and the Jesus movement um, as a replacement of uh, uh, the Roman Empire. And so like the, yeah. the casting out of demons, like a lot of that stuff, it's like, it's not just like the cynical part of me isn't just that this is throwing off the empire, but literally like that was the old boss meet the new boss mm -hmm. if that makes I, sense I, not quite I a think, gnostic reading legit, but like yeah a, but i I, I think you're oh sorry I, i'm interrupting you but I, I i was just got i was just going to chime in to be like you're right jason <laughs> no <laughs> well, and, i don't know that maybe, I'm right. yeah maybe that's not the most gnostic reading or maybe that's not you know a reading we're comfortable with but but i think that is what, what the author is trying to get to right so it, at least it's there like yeah there's uh there was an, an article i think in the atlantic years ago something i think it was called jesus without the miracles mm -hmm. and it was like talking about i think the gospel of thomas and and just some of the other non non-biblical gospels as almost defined by their lack of the 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 magic powers and, the, and any of the like it was all just wisdom and um uh and it, it kind of made the point of like of of how much some of those miracles are meant to reinforce authority or reinforce this new authority, this new perspective. And that's, that was just something that I really had in my head when I was reading, reading it this time. Yeah, no, I, I think that's exactly what, what the author is, is getting to. Um, okay. So I did make a question sheet. We we're talking about it before. It's not the best <laughs> one I've made. The, uh, <laughs> 
the next the next thing I have on the question sheet is damn how about that ending which <laughs> it, which I which I actually did reference on our our gospel of John show but I will reference again I'll read it now there is an extended ending which is uh, scholars and Christians <laughs> the church has known for a long time that this ending was tacked on later we have lots of versions of Mark without the tacked on ending so here's the original ending um I'm just going to read the whole thing. And when the Sabbath had passed, Mary Magdalene and James, Mary, and Salome purchased spices that may come and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the Sabbath week, they came to the tomb while the sun was rising. And they said to one another, who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? And looking up, they see that the stone's been rolled back, for it was extremely large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting to the right, clothed in a white robe. And they were amazed. And he says to them, do not be amazed. You seek Jesus the Nazarene, who's been crucified, but he's been raised. He's not here. Look, the place where they laid him. But go tell the disciples and Peter that he precedes you into Galilee. There you'll see him as he told you. And going out, they fled from the tomb, for trembling and bewilderment had taken hold of them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The end. <laughs> I, I one of the one of the best endings in Western literature, in, in my opinion. And, you know, we can talk about this a little bit more. Uh, a lot of people examining Mark as a literary uh, work because it is so short, because the prose isn't that great. Um, people sort of miss that it actually is quite brilliantly put together and it actually has um, a lot of recurring themes, a lot of symbolic themes and a lot of irony. And then there's this freaking amazing ending, which if you think about for five seconds, I really love that the which is not an angel, by the way. We'll talk about this guy in a little bit. But a mysterious man in a white robe, uh, he tells him to go uh, find Peter and the, um, uh, the, the apostles, the disciples, um, who, by the way, have fled, not only fled the crucifixion, but fled Jerusalem uh, because they're chicken shit, uh, and have left Jesus to suffer and die by himself. Um, chicken they, shit is in the Greek. Yes, that's right. Yes. So so the man tells him to go find them, but it ends with they told nobody. They were afraid. Um, so how about that ending? Deacon Angie, what do you think about that ending? Um, you know, with the books I was reading in preparation for this um, presentation, so the uh, Misquoting Jesus by Bart Ehrman, he talks a lot about how Mark reinforces that the disciples didn't get it. And it's sort of another version of them not getting it, not knowing what to do with what just happened and and sort of being in the ambiguity of, of what Jesus isn't doing. Um, so yeah, I just thought it was very, I could imagine being in that situation and just being absolutely terrified. Um, and, and then, you know, we tack on the miraculousness, but also it, it's sort of the, the grittiness of what that early religion was. It's just scary and, and, and not, you know, we're not in salvation in, in this particular moment. And so also as a Gnostic, we're not, we're not seeing salvation in the same way that, that maybe other texts or other interpretations are, are constantly preaching. We're, we're sort of stuck in the grittiness of the burning dumpster fire of, the world yeah yeah i i i agree and i and i think that's a, an absolutely brilliant interpretation so thank you so much for sharing it and again for personal doses or connecting things to gnosticism I, I you know i always have these we actually have a really nice fans listeners and watchers and i rarely get any unpleasant feedback but of course i have that demon in the back of my head that little demiurge uh <laughs> which, which says to me i like to call everything in religion that i like gnosticism and everything i don't like not gnosticism right <laughs> um but but that said you know we are the gnostics now and i and i think at least for the last couple hundred years uh, i would definitely say for the original text as well but you, you know there's scholars that would disagree with me but this this sort of existentialist striving plunging into the darkness uncertainty uh irony uh working through what this means that, you know, this is Gnosticism for me, and this is an ending that I think very much leads to that, right? There isn't a clean uh, resurrection. There isn't a clean salvation. There isn't a clean anything. There's only confusion and fear and weirdness. And we're left to be like, what, what do I do with this? What does this mean? You know, the text doesn't hold your hand. Um, Jason, what did, what did you think about that ending? Well, I got the Peter Jackson extended edition, so I got the extra <laughs> ending. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> with my DVD. No, um, uh, DVD, there's a retro term. Um, but uh, yeah, no, uh, I, so I'm, I'm actually just kind of encountering this idea right now. And I'm, I'm fascinated by it because I think it's so much more interesting than what's here. Um, uh, which like for anybody who, who knows the gospel even less than I do, or as I, as about as much as I did 48 hours ago, um, after that bit, uh, of the, the people being afraid, then it kind of goes to what you've probably heard of before of Jesus, like, uh, going and visiting the disciples and then kind of having a last, like, you know, here's your marching orders off you go. And then, um, uh, and it, and you know, then there's like a he floats up to heaven and there's trumpets and it's you know it's a it's the extended edition so there's like a lot of extra fufra, um, but uh, yeah I think it's actually absolutely fascinating to just end it on that on on the um, uh, on that the without like without him literally coming and talking to people. Because it almost puts the faith. This is just me responding. This is the hottest of takes. Um, the uh, it puts the faith on the reader, listener, whoever it is that's encountering this text. Like, do you think he came back? If that makes sense, you know, yeah. or do you think he's still around? Do you think mm -hmm. you've got a connection? Like, it kind of, which I, I'm actually way more fascinated by than this end than the the extended ending that I read. Um, so yeah. That's my yeah. hot take. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I, I think people have probably uh, picked up that I, I'm not a fan of the extended ending, although we'll get to this very shortly. I keep promising um, <laughs> that <laughs> there might be some other extended endings I do like, but coming to that in a sec. But first, Nick, <laughs> hot takes on that end. Um, yeah, I, I feel like I also thought of the word as existentialist because it just feels like the, you know, they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. I mean, that just feels like some kind of a capstone of the whole way of how jesus is throughout the text which we were very saying is pretty alien and yeah. nobody I, I wrote i was looking at some notes i had in this from years ago and, and one of the things i wrote down was like nobody fares very well in this text and the disciples <laughs> don't fare well they're like idiots and yeah, then the, uh, yeah the, Je the people jesus, who are healed <laughs> jesus is a surly weird alien and yeah. the disciples are dumb dumbs and but everybody the and everybody, uh, pretty, everybody yeah. Else, yeah they're all they're worse not, than them he's pretty mean to them too so it's, this is the <laughs> one that has the woman who is like well you know she convinces him and kind of you know by shaming him a little bit by saying he's like i'm not going to give food to the dogs and she's like even the dogs eat the scraps under the table she's kind of a mean jesus being pretty mean and then so just throughout it it's kind of like everybody even the people healed are, are you know don't come across so well nobody understands so it almost it, there's like an apophatic sort of thing at the end where it's just like you don't get this yeah. so and that and that's it and so and similar with the Jesus' last words on the cross, I feel like in Mark, it, it has, you know, the the famous sick, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But it doesn't have what I think is either Luke or Matthew where it explains that like Jesus said this because he had to fulfill this or whatever, like which is a makes it nicer or easier to understand, as opposed to like this person was in massive pain and this is like a quotation from the scripture that he would use in that, you know, in that situation maybe. Um, mm -hmm. to, to express that God isn't with him. He doesn't feel like God. So that is, and it doesn't give handhold at all. It just has that. And that's it. So yeah, no, nah, it's pretty stark. Yeah. And uh, the, recently, uh, the, Nick, you and I have been talking about this and just yeah. expect some more programming in the future, but <laughs> I, I've been getting more into radical theology. I'm basically doing a degree that uh, incorporates a lot of radical theology, uh, atheistic Christianity, uh, which uh, which makes a lot out of what Nick's talking about, makes a lot out of Mark, right? Both the mm -hmm. abandonment of Jesus on the cross, uh, you know, uh, and, and the resurrection, uh, uh, the lack of resurrection, you know, for for some of the the radical theologians, um, for some of the atheists of Christian uh, 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 Christians, uh, you, God really did abandon Jesus on the cross, or God did die on the cross, right? And the resurrection is is something that is that is left for for us to figure out, whatever the heck mm -hmm. it is. It, it just that's why it ends there. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, Clark, 
Um, oh, wait, but before I call on you, Clark, uh, I, I, I keep mentioning the extended ending that I don't like. Um, but here's how that extended ending starts, which is very interesting. Now, rising early on the first day of the Sabbath week, he appeared first to Mary the Magdalen, from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went and announced it to those who had been with him as they were mourning and weeping. So I find that very interesting that the extended version uh, 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 starts with an, uh, an appearance to Mary Magdalene. Uh, but Clark, uh, the, what do you think about that ending? Uh, well, I, uh, well, so uh, on the first, the initial ending, I don't know, for whatever it's worth, I have a couple of points, and then I'll bore you to death on my thing on the second ending. Um, I was just sitting here looking while you guys were talking about emphasizing for they were afraid because it's so abrupt and in your face. It's like, it's very vivid. You can't miss it. Um, and I was just thinking, sitting here thinking one of the things I noticed, and this is just me being weird, the very first word in the Gospel of Mark is RK. Um, where we get the word archons from, and it just means in a beginning or with a beginning, that sort of thing. It, it, it mimics Genesis and John and all of that. But, um, but the last phrase would be, they were afraid. I find that to be a very pessimistic, Gnostic take on the world. Yeah. In the beginning, there was a bunch of fear. But um, one of the other things about the first ending I've noticed was Peter is picked out from the rest of the disciples. Um, the young man in the white robe in the in, in the in the in the tomb says, "Do not be amazed. You seek Jesus of Nazarene who has been crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look at the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he precedes you into Galilee." And I kind of see this as a continuation of the tradition of the tension that is between Mary Magdalene and Peter that we see in several other texts, including my uh, beloved Gospel of Mary or Obsession Gospel of Mary, whichever you take on that. Um, also, uh, interestingly enough, I don't know, uh, of course, it's a big mystery of who this boy in white is in the tomb, but um, if he was any sort of a disciple, then Mary Magdalene may arguably was not the first to see Jesus arisen as the boy in the tomb. But that was just another weird thought that I had in my head. I don't know. Uh, that's not laid out explicitly, no. um, but it's it's definitely a possibility, I think. So the, I think the second ending, the second ending is a sort of a trope that you find in a lot of uh, early Christian literature where the, after Jesus dies, there's a resurrection scene and the, and, and the apostles or the disciples have meetings. They have a meeting. And, then, and oftentimes these stories are used to justify um, apostolic succession uh, as well as introducing new teachings that Jesus wasn't, didn't explicitly say in the, in, in the gospels that came beforehand. So Gnostics love this sort of thing. A great example is in the Nag Hammadi library is the, Peter, the letter from Peter to Philip. It's fantastic, and I'm absolutely convinced that is in direct conversation with the Gospel of Mary. Um, I'm probably wrong, but that's my thing. So a couple of things I'm noticing here in relation to the Gospel of Mary. I don't know how familiar everybody is with that, but um, of course he first appears to Mary, and Mary is his replacement. As Jesus' yeah. replacement appears to be in Mark, he definitely, she definitely is in, 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 the, in, in, in her text. Um, Jesus casts seven demons out of Mary. Now, in, in, in the Gospel of Mary, well, that's the Mark, in the Gospel of Mary, um, the soul ascent is about four different powers, but the final power, wrath, is the most demeaning, the demonic of them, I think, and it is seven different forms of wrath. Mm -hmm. Just making connections there with numbers. The so number seven and twelve are all throughout the Gospel of Mark, and if you're gnostically and or mystically minded, you notice these numbers and automatically thinking start thinking in terms of seven, forty, twelve. Um, not all of the disciples believe Mary. I think that's probably pretty common amongst all of these sorts of stories, but it's it definitely it, it plays up here. Interestingly enough, the mo the emotions are high. People are crying. The Gospel of Mary is famous for for the tears that it that that, that it, it shows. Mary is crying. The disciples are crying. Um, in Mary, the disciples cry after Jesus leaves, and they are stressed about going out into the world. So Jesus leaves in the story. He gets up and goes away, and 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 they start to weep because Jesus, they feel that Jesus has basically just told them to go out and suffer and die. Um, and uh, in Mark, um, those who, quote, have been with him weep as Mary talks to them. This just seems like a very interesting detail, that the shared detail that goes mm. on. The disciples are crying. They are upset. Mary has to calm them down. Mary continues to teach them. I don't know. That, that was just fascinating to me. Is there a direct connection? I'm not suggesting that. Um, but certainly these details carry over very interesting. That's a lot of conversation to be had there. So that would have made a fantastic undergraduate paper. I wish I had noticed it 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. Anyway, can you, I'll stop. Uh, yeah. Can I ask a question? Yes. <laughs> um, would you, I, I'm guessing what I you mean, you kind of no. just did. But... Yeah, I guess. <laughs> yeah, okay. So moving on. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, there you go. You're done. No. Um, so uh, I made a point to read the King James Version um, mm. because that, to me, uh, I had a theater professor once tell me that, like, if you read the if you read the whole King James Bible and the complete works of Shakespeare, you're kind of good for most literary references, because um, uh, that it'll be basically from those two sources. And so that so then I uh, that that was why I chose to make sure that I read this because I thought um, its its usefulness was also going to be good in terms of future contexts that I would encounter more quotes in and such. So is the the reason I have the extended edition, is that because it's the King James or it, does it get more complicated than that? Um, I, I think that's about it. The, the extended version is, is the most commonly read version. It's the version that, that is in most Bibles and most modern, my definition of modern being the last 500 years, right? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. You're going to have that, that extended uh, ending. Uh, a lot of Bibles now, starting in the 20th century, they've started, if they do have the extended ending, there's a note. So um, it's either in brackets or there is just literally the, an interruption being like, he, Here's a traditional ending <laughs> that that doesn't seem to be in the <laughs> earliest versions, but um, it, it's a lot of fun because you know I, I was talking last time uh, about the Leviticon, right, which is a a version of of John that has a very similar ending. Is it an ancient text? Is it a more modern text? We don't really know. But like uh, we're talking about with Clark, it it then. Th we know that they at least had Mark if they didn't have the Leviticon, the early Gnostics. So it does really sound like they are like something like the secret book of John is a post-resurrection. The whole book is a post-resurrection appearance by Jesus with him just talking about, you know, what happened at the beginning, right? The Gnostic origin story. And it starts off with, you know, John being really bummed out and kind of doubting if, if, if Jesus was the Messiah, right? Because he had been crucified. And you're kind of led, if you read Mark, where Jesus doesn't appear to the disciples, where where Mary and the others don't uh, spread the good news about the resurrection, the secret John makes a lot more sense, right? So it's it seems quite likely there's a strong possibility that both it and the Gospel of Mary might be endings to Mark, right? Not the original quote unquote ending, but you know, Gnostics were reading Mark and being like, well, what happened next? Right. And well, these types of this trope, this notion definitely allows itself for intertextual interpretation. Yeah. Um, the whole point, I think, is that they're using this as a springboard to start introducing new ideas. It's it's pretty interesting. A lot of when you start seeing this in a lot of the stuff, when yeah. you start looking at those details. Um, and it's also interesting too, uh, Jason. You mentioned you know reading the longer version. Uh, uh, Jesus uh, pulls a poochie, right? He goes back to his home planet at the end. Um, he. Uh, <laughs> I don't you know, know if everybody's going to get that reference, but that was great. Was yeah, it's it's a Simpsons joke. We'll I'll link it I'll link it in okay. the show notes. Um, but anyway, so Jesus is beamed up, but that is that is sort of both an anti mystic, anti gnostic um, uh, inter, uh, addition, I believe, because you know Christians had to start saying that the resurrection has a clear ending, right? Like Jesus resurrects, but then he gets beamed up to heaven. That means that you can't see him anymore, right? The, because you can't have visions of him. You can't have a Gnostic experience of the, of the resurrected uh, Christ come and give you more information, to give you gnosis, to give you interpretations of ancient texts, to give you insight into the world because he's been beamed up. So I really do think, you know, I, again, it may not be specifically the Gnostics or Gnostic groups, but, you know, Christians who were saying, oh, we're actually having ongoing experiences of the resurrected Jesus. Um, we, we have the proto-Orthodox Christians putting this little addition into Mark and then the other Gospels saying, well, no, you didn't because, oh, yeah, he was resurrected, duh. But then he was beamed up to his home planet. So, um, okay, the, the, we are, the, the, hey, as we were worried that we wouldn't have enough to talk about. We're already at 48 minutes. If any of you need to go, just let me know because <laughs> we're only we're only halfway through my very poor um, question sheet. Uh, but uh, again, I, I kept hinting of things to come. Uh, Deacon Angie, you mentioned Morton Smith. I'll try to make this as fast as possible. We have a whole show on Secret Mark. I will link it below. Everybody go watch that show. Um, uh, uh, 
in the uh, 1940s, 1950s, um, a, uh, a scholar named Morden Smith found a uh, document uh, that was a letter from the early church father Clement. Um, the, the original text has now been lost, and the letter talks about a, a, another version of the Gospel of Mark. This kind of gets more complicated. And I, I keep talking about how this isn't a Gnostic work created by Gnostics, but uh, here's perhaps contra that. So Clement is writing, and he's saying that there's the Mark that we all know, right? Abrupt, weird, surly alien Jesus, doesn't really explain a lot. But then he says, there's a mystical Mark kept in the, the Alexandrian church, a different version of Mark, a second Mark. The whole thing's rewritten, but it's, it's only for Christians in the know. You have to be an initiated full Christian to have access to this other version of Mark. And this is, uh, the, he, he specifically says mystical gospel, um, a mystical version of the gospel of Mark. Uh, so pretty, pretty interesting stuff. Then he says that the, the a Gnostic group called the Carpocratians uh, stole mystical Mark, they got access to it, and then they wrote their own version. So now we have three versions of Mark, uh, two of those being mystical, esoteric, gnostic -y versions, one of the three being extremely Gnostic, according to Clement, right? Now, uh, we have all sorts of problems with this, and then he quotes two, two interesting passages. It's like, did, did the scholar Morton Smith make it up? Is it a uh, medieval forgery? Because it's uh, the, the letter from Clement is uh, 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 written in the, the 1500s, so it's supposed to be from the, the, the early second century. So, you know, it's somebody writing down an ancient text that they've discovered, yada, yada, yada. And then if you believe that it's all true, okay, well, is Clement telling the truth? Because one could easily see perhaps the original form of Mark was the Carpocratian version, right? And then the Proto-Orthodox make the version that we know. They edit out all the Gnostic stuff, and then, then they have another version for internal use. Like, we just don't know. So very, very fascinating stuff, uh, very interesting stuff. But um, And here's our strong connection to, to Gnosticism and to some Gnostics. Now, uh, I'll just read, quote-unquote, Secret Mark, what we have from Secret Mark. He only quotes one paragraph from it. And it goes into the middle of the narrative. So he actually says uh, in the letter where this is supposed to be. So if you're reading Mark, this paragraph is supposed to go in. And people probably already know this story, but it's, it's normally only found in John. Uh, and then they came to Bethany, and a certain woman whose brother has died was there. And coming, she prostrated herself before Jesus and says to him, Son of David, have mercy on me. But the disciples rebuked her. And Jesus, being angered, went off of her into the garden where the tomb was. And straightway a great cry was heard from the tomb. And going near, Jesus rolled away the stone from the door of the tomb. And straightway going in where the youth was, he stretched out his hand and raised him, seizing his hand. But the youth, looking upon him, loved him and began to beseech him that he might be with him. And going out from the tomb, they came into the house of the youth, for he was rich. And after six days, Jesus told him what to do, and in the evening the youth comes to him wearing a linen cloth over his naked body. And he remained with him that night, for Jesus taught him the mystery of the kingdom of God, and hence arising, he returned to the other side of the Jordan. I should also mention as well, the Carpocratians, and this is um, uh, probably a, a lie, uh, if maybe it could be true, uh, were said by the heresiologists to uh, love gay sex and to share their partners and to do all sorts of weird, freaky, sexy stuff. So, um, Morden Smith was was a gay man, um, and some people have thought that perhaps he, he created this whole story as sort of a... Um, and a, a revenge against mainstream Christianity, because you, when we read it through modern eyes, uh, you know we have this this naked guy who loves Jesus, and after Jesus raises him, uh, they spend this this special time together. Uh, people have have sort of read a. Um, a, uh, a, a homosexual interpretation into that, um, and that's sometimes given evidence that it's uh, that it's a forgery. But some very interesting stuff in there. Um, something that, uh, uh, particularly, we, we were talking about sort of Gnostic esoteric. Here we have kind of hints or reconstruction of of this sort of perhaps magical system that Clark. Clark was talking about, right? Because it very much seems that Jesus is initiating this young man. Right, um, and giving them these special teachings. The other thing too is um, here we have a, a a young man wearing a simple uh, 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 white uh, robe, right? Um, and they they mention that he's naked beneath it. We're all naked beneath our clothes. So it's kind of weird that they that they mention this both in Secret Mark, but also Mark, because there's a, two very interesting things that seem to come out of nowhere which is why one of the reasons that people think the secret mark is real, which is when Jesus is being arrested, 
um, a, uh, a, a disciple who Jesus loves runs away, and he's wearing a simple white robe, and it drops off of him, and he runs away naked. Like, that's weird. <laughs> and then, what happens to Jesus' resurrection that we already talked about, and that Clark mentioned, and I mentioned, not an angel. It's an angel in Luke and Matthew, right? But it is a young man, and Mark makes sure to say that he's wearing a simple garment that he's naked under. Uh, and he's the one, of course, who tells Mary Magdalene, we just ta told the story, that uh, Jesus has been resurrected. So it seems that the young man um, in this resurrection story in Secret Mark, the young man who runs away when Jesus is arrested, and the young man found in Jesus' tomb are the same young man. Right. And all of a sudden, the, these stories make much more sense. And I'll kind of leave it up to you folks. Maybe, maybe somebody, maybe, the, you know, the, you all seem really smart. Maybe you can help me out here, um, which is when I was talking about some of the, the the intricate symbolism and construction of the Gospel of Mark. If Secret Mark is real and this was sort of originally in it, now we have this layer of symbolism that I haven't quite decoded. Right. Because um, Jesus brings this young man back to life in a garden, in a tomb that has a big stone in front of it that Jesus is able to push aside, right? And then before Jesus is killed, the young man runs away. When Jesus is resurrected, the young man is found in his tomb that's in a garden that the narrator makes sure to have uh, some narrative saying, you know, Mary says, how can we get into the tomb? This stone is so big, who will roll it away, right? So I'm not quite sure what the writer of the of the Gospel of Mark is trying to do with this young man and this nested symbolism around resurrection, around tombs, around stones, around clothes and being naked. That also makes me think of, uh, of Gnosticism, where they often use, you know, a simple robe uh, and being naked as um, uh, as a symbolic structure. We find this in the in the Gospel of Thomas and other places where the um, the robe is our bodies, and we want to be naked. We want to cast off the bodies, or at least the demands of the bodies, the control of the body, the uh, flesh that uh, makes us do things we don't want to do to, to be uh, fully realized beings. Uh, okay, secret secret Mark, go off. Uh, who I started? Uh, Deacon Angie, you said you were reading about Morton Smith. Um, <laughs> what do you what do you think about Secret Mark and, and some of this uh, some of this jazz? Uh, I believe I skimmed some of Secret Mark. <laughs> I mean, of, uh, of Morton Smith. Um, you know, I'm a little bit like you. I I um, I don't have too many opinions on this one, and I think I'm definitely not gonna. I'm gonna bow out on this one, and and see if Clark or Nick or Jason have anything. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Uh, although, um, also, I, I should mention, because you, you mentioned you skimmed some, some Morton Smith and mentioned Jesus the Magician. Uh, Morton Smith has a book called Jesus the Magician, and he really thought that, you know, Jesus was sort of portrayed as, as a magician um, in the Greco-Roman sense in the earliest sources. And we actually do have, uh, besides Mark and besides Secret Mark, we have mosaics and uh, art, represents, art representation of Jesus using a magic wand. Right. Mm -hmm. So people also think that maybe Morton Smith made this up because besides the possible gay stuff, it also kind of shows a, a magical Jesus, you know, this Jesus who kind of uh, brings a guy back from the dead and then sort of like initiates him and teaches him in this very much um, uh, teacher student Greco Roman mystery called magical relationship. Um, but I think the text is probably real. I, I think, uh, and, and if you watch, everybody right after this episode is going to watch the talk gnosis that we did on Secret Mark, uh, where, you know, the scholar we talked to also thinks it's real, you know, by real and ancient text. Morton Smith didn't make it up. Uh, Nick, uh, any thoughts on Secret Mark? I'm worth, I'm thinking about the the whole, yeah, the passage that's in even the canonical Mark about the the, the, the young man who ends up being naked. It's just so weird. Weird. <laughs> like it's so it's weird. It comes but out of nowhere. Yeah. And I did read that the Greek for young man there is the same word, and I'm sure Clark could see that, check this, but it's the same as the the resurrection thing where the young mm -hmm. man's sitting. So it is does seem to be like the same person. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, where to get from that? I read one thing. This is like Wikipedia, though. But one one thing on the very short Wikipedia page called "Naked Fugitive," which is about this guy, which is a funny thing to be in history. But it says maybe it was an earlier tradition of somebody who you know to, they don't want to name him because of potential persecution or something. Like, there's something like that. I don't know. It just it doesn't feel like it fits much. So that, that does to me feel like make me think the secret mark story might uh you know more likely to be true just because it gives it a little more context like there's a little more going on he doesn't just, come out of nowhere uh, yeah, yeah. So it's not out of nowhere like, but, i remember that guy yeah, yeah and, it, and you know as you described it it also felt very similar to you know the like a bridal chamber story 
yes. of you know taking or you know and interpreting it like less literally like the soul or something like that so this um which yeah, frequently like you said already the nakedness part relates a lot to kind of the, that di dialogue about the soul you know um so yeah i don't know but it's very, it's very odd it adds to the kind of weird alien kind of nature of the text a little bit yeah uh clark any thoughts on on secret mark and this mysterious uh uh, uh naked <laughs> what was it naked fugitive naked the naked fugitive yeah. the naked fugitive i like the naked fugitive idea that's good um I, I mean, I don't. I, I, the 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 naked young man is, or uh, the young man who becomes naked, um, is is just it's pretty damned odd. I saw a little bit of back and forth between this being a reference to what we moderns would consider to be homosexual sex. Of course, back then they had a very different notion of what that was, what homosexuality. They wouldn't have thought of it necessarily in those terms. It depends on the details, the class status of the people involved, and all of that um, was more important than whether or not it was two guys. Uh, that's my understanding. It's not really my field. So it's interesting that some folks think it was Morton Smith because Morton Smith doesn't really talk about that aspect very much. If he made this up and made this about homosexual relationship, Morton Smith doesn't have much to say about that. Um, he does seem to emphasize the, ma the magician aspect of it and the initiation aspect of it. But I also find that to be a little bit odd too, because if it's an initiation slash baptis baptism ritual, um, that's not mentioned directly either mm -hmm. um, at all, actually. It, it might possibly be hinted at in the symbolism of crossing the Jordan River, um, but again, not mentioned explicitly. Why wouldn't they mention it explicitly if that's what was going on? Um, I kind of, right now, I'm kind of toying with the idea that, uh, that John, you haven't brought up yet, and I'm wondering what everybody else might think about this, that the, this is some sort of symbolism of uh, a divine twin or a higher self. Mm, the this might fall yeah. into that sort of thing, the white, the white, the white um, uh, uh, cloth would might fall into that sort of thing and him sitting at the head. I think he's sitting at the head of the tomb, right? At the head of where Jesus was laid down. Is that correct? I, I'd have right. to look. So all of that seems to point in that direction more than, you know, salacious gay sex. What's it? What interesting? Can I say one thing about that? I was thinking yeah, today while re, while rereading some of this that um, you know at early in the gospel uh, the viewers think that Jesus has a demon or an unclean spirit in him and builds he's he builds above or something. There's a section about that. Oh and, right, right, yeah, right. So so I was reading that he Jesus do the stuff. Yeah, and then Jesus' explanation where he says, you know, how can Satan drive out Satan if a kingdom is divided oh, itself, divided that kingdom cannot stand, all that stuff. And then he says, if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand. That is the end of him. So, which is interesting because, like, isn't this kind of the end? I mean, that led me to believe that there was some weird something there where there's a spirit in Jesus. And maybe right. this is the spirit. And you know? if the house is divided against yeah. itself, can't stand. And then if Jesus' sacred twin leaves, yeah, he Jesus dies. Leaves, he goes. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, but, and then remember, Mark. Mark does seem to be an adoptionist, right? Which is the the gospel opens, and this is clearer in the Greek. But the uh, Jesus becomes a Christ at his baptism. The the spirit comes down upon him like a dove, right? So you know, there's Jesus, and then there's the spirit, which is something that um, uh, a lot of Gnostics believed as well. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the the Aeon Christ, the emanation. Uh, that is part of the emanatory structure of, of divinity rippling out, comes down and joins with the human Jesus at his baptism. Um, so if you kind of think about that, 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 you know, the spirit comes upon him and the young man is that spirit. Yeah, yeah, it works quite well this, with, with the this, opening of Mark and with the adoptionism. This, this fits in with something I noticed when I was going through it. If I, if I can just take a minute, and it's, hopefully this won't be too confusing. Um, there's a lot of stuff what we haven't really talked about in this text about the otherworldliness of Jesus being in um, um, many things that he does. He's in a different place. He's on top of a mountain. He's out in the wilderness. He's on top of the water. And when he does these things, miraculous things tend to happen. The water calms. Jesus walks on it. He has some sort of, you know, a, a miraculous experience on the mountaintop um, where the white cloud shows up. Like all of these things, he's always in a different place. And the first different place he's at where something magical happens is when he comes up out of the water at his baptism by John and he sees the dove come down. And of course it's internal, only he really sees that. It's very, the text seems very clear about that. Um, and there's, there's, after that, Jesus goes into the, the wilderness. Mm -hmm. And in he's, when he's in the wilderness, he's interacting with, with different spirits, yeah. both good and bad. 
And it's almost as if there is a direct connection between his baptism and his ability to interact on a spiritual level. Oh, uh, that's that's that, a really good point because does that make sense? this no, is they, also they, they, much tied in with metanoia and the concept of forgiveness uh, of sins. Which, interestingly enough, if you look into the Greek, Jesus preaches metanoia after he comes out of the wilderness. Mm. John is baptizing people and preaching metanoia. Most of the people, though, who go and see John and get baptized by John do not experience metanoia. They just confess their sins. They don't actually change their selves. It doesn't say they change themselves. They don't change their mind. They don't change the inner man. It's only said in relation to what Jesus is preaching about and Jesus having that experience. Yeah. I I, I I think you're spot on, and thanks for sort of revealing some mysteries to me. Uh, uh, I'm the young man with the cloth that's being uh, taken for, for seven days by Clark because, you know, I mentioned at the beginning uh, the pace of Mark, right? But it's he, he, he does – you, I, I, you know, it's kind of hard to tell because of all the run-on sentences. Maybe it's clear in Greek, but it, he does seem to connect the baptism with the what happens in the wilderness, right? In, mm -hmm. in the, um, the the Bentley Hart translation, it's, um, and a voice came out of the heavens, you are my son, uh, the beloved, in you I have delighted. And then it says, and immediately. So it does connect, the and immediately connects the baptism mm -hmm. to what happens next. The spirit cast him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by the accused user and was with the wild beast so as, as clark was saying the accuser satan uh, uh the devil but then what happens next and the angels minister to him so like you right. were saying yeah um and you can all you can all almost read it i i mean you can read it uh it's i think a perfectly valid interpretation because it, the the text doesn't spell it uh, sp uh spell it out it says you're my son uh the beloved in you i have delighted it says and immediately the spear spirit cast him out into the wilderness that that can read almost as a miracle which is he got baptized yeah. and then you know the people around them were like where'd jesus go because the spirit actually grabbed him and threw him into the wilderness <laughs> yeah, it does sound like that. It sounds like he got possessed and driven out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was gonna say it sounds like an exorcism too, which leads me to think about the later verse where it says, you know, Jesus is Satan and he says, How could Satan be divided against himself? Or how could Satan be divided against himself, I think? And then, you know, this would cause him to fall as if he's explaining his own question. So there could be like a Jesus is Satan thing, uh, and that you I don't know, there's a weird you know. Well yeah, there's um I, I've seen some really I there's this site that that's a mythicist site and you know i i don't necessarily like or agree with the mythicist but sometimes they dig up interesting stuff and have interesting interpretations but they have a gnostic there's, there's a site called varider i'll link it up again uh that sort of talks about that nick and, and talks about the the connections between jesus and satan and the demiurge um and you know has a, a possible not you know gnostic interpretation of mark but i think it's kind of far-fetched uh talk about far-fetched uh we should start to wrap up because we're past the hour but again you know look i keep promising about the future i keep promising about things i'm going to put into the show notes you get so much watching the show folks you get so much <laughs> we, we give so much so i'm going to link uh, uh bishop scott rosbach of the ajc uh, many years ago at an ajc conclave gave a talk on mark uh related to a book called uh the gospel and the zodiac the secret truth about jesus i'll link that up below um and it's it's a thesis that I don't really buy, but I think it's interesting. So I'll it, it's a um, the the writer is a Unitarian minister, so you know he's not he's not a quack, uh, um, and he does have both scholarly and uh, religious training. But in his book, uh, he says Jesus's miracles and parables were not to be taken literally. The author demonstrates through a systematic reading of Jesus's life and teaching that this is a dramatization of internal processes. The text was created by ancient Gnostics who believed that the gospel story was not an eyewitness account, but an allegory in which the seeker's internal journey mirrored the sun's 12-month cycle. Mark's primary metaphor is the yearly journey of the sun through the signs of the zodiac. And this reflects the structure in, its, in the narrative moving from Jesus's baptism at the beginning of his ministry in Aries, the time of the spring equinox and the theme of newness through his suffering, death and resurrection in Pisces. So I, I, I think that's kind of neat. I, I, I think it is an interesting symbolic structure that you could read into Mark. Uh, and read-ins I think are fine. 
right? Because that is a Gnostic impulse, which is, you know, maybe the author didn't mean the symbolism, but they constructed this, uh, this structure that I can see symbolism and get some right. spiritual teachings out of. But, you know, famously, there's a, there's sort of a, a weird scene uh, when they arrive in Jerusalem and uh, Jesus says to the disciples, go look for the man who's carrying water and follow him. And that's where we're going to have supper, right? And it's like, it's weird. And then, you know, this author says, oh, okay, well, the man carrying water is, is Aquarius, right? It's that That's why this weird scene is in here. All 12 of the zodiacal signs are in there uh, and they're making a connection. You know, Jesus is all of us. Uh, uh, and it's not quite quite astral theology because they are saying that the journey of the sun represents the internal spiritual journey, which is what this story is actually about playing off the symbolism of both the sun and what happens inside of us. So uh, I think it's a stretch. I, I should go back and, you know, I read the book many years ago and, and I did yeah. like his sort of creative finding of all 12 zodiacal signs. I, I think it's a stretch, but I think it's fun. Jonathan, when did that come out? Uh, 2008. Okay, it's interesting because Frater Akkad, who we had talked about on this podcast, said an almost identical statement to that in an unpublished oh. letter. Which, oh, no so I'm wondering yeah. where he got it from. But it's in one of the letters that, you know, I'm, I'm trying to work on writing, transcribing, which is, yeah. so he actually says li the life of Jesus was undoubtedly a solar ritual, etc. And then kind of goes into that. It's just one paragraph, but yeah. yeah. Well, that, that's also sort of a common idea at the, yeah. you know, the 19th century, the early 20th century as well. But uh, that is really interesting, though, and that'd be almost 100 years ago, or maybe more than 100 years ago, right? The Fat Arcade's writing that letter. Yeah. So, uh, well before that this book was uh, was put together and written. So, yeah. it's really cool. Okay, well, uh, I think it's just about wrap-up time. Does, does anybody have anything that they wanted to get out about Mark before we do? Folks, it's been super awesome. Look, we got to an hour and 10 minutes. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, we'll have to do this again sometime with some other text. I don't know if we can do it of Luke and Matthew. Maybe we'll do it of like the Gospel of Thomas or actual Gnostic text. I don't know. But we'll do it. <laughs> let's, let's do it again sometime. Um, Clark, thanks so much for joining us. And of course, yeah, everybody, thanks, thanks so much for joining us. But it's been uh, really great to get you all to, uh, back together to talk about uh, another Gospel. So, um, yeah, I, I guess that's it. Goodbye. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Yeah.